All right. So hello, everyone. I see people trickling in, which is great. Good evening and welcome to Stanford CARES monthly community health talk series. My name is Christina Lee and I'm an internal medicine physician and future Stanford geriatrics fellow and I'll be your moderator for the evening. I'm really pleased to bring you this series of talks co-sponsored by the Stanford Health Library and the Vincent B.C. Wu Foundation. Tonight's speaker is Dr. Kekoa Tapara, who will be speaking on combating structural racism in health data to achieve health equity among Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander, or NHPI individuals, are often aggregated with Asian individuals in medical research. However, there are important distinctions between these populations that are underappreciated by the greater research community. NHPI and Asian individuals have very different health disparities, and by grouping these two racial groups, NHPI health disparities are often masked. Dr. Keiko Tabara, who is the MD PhD, will discuss the importance of data disaggregation and inclusion of NHPI patients in medical research and its importance in combating systemic racism. Kekua Tapara is a native Hawaiian radiation oncology physician scientist trainee at Stanford Medicine. He was born and raised in Hawaii and graduated from the Kamehameha schools. He completed his PhD at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and MD at the Mayo Clinic. His research has been published in the Lancet, JAMA, JAMA Network Open, JAMA Health Forum, and JCO Oncology Practice on research topics including Pacific Islander health disparities, physician workforce representation, access to cancer care, and the impact of cancer healthcare costs on cancer survival. His life mission is to return home to the islands to provide high quality cancer care to Hawaii's multicultural communities. So please, everyone, welcome Dr. Kekoa Tapara. All right, aloha kako, everyone. Uh, my name is Kekoa. I'm a PGY3 here at Stanford uh, in the Department of Radiation Oncology. And I wanted to mahalo the Center for Asian Health Research and Education for allowing me to be here today to talk about a topic that I'm really uh, passionate about, something about my communities, really about how we can um, achieve health equity among Pacific Islanders with um, better health data. And so I wanted to start my talk off, obviously, with um, a land acknowledgement, uh, recognizing that Stanford occupies the ancestral land of the Muakma Ohlone tribe. And I acknowledge this land uh, continues to be a part of the Ohlone people's lives. And I'm really humbled to exist and coexist in this space and I'll uh, continue to learn from our indigenous cousins from across the Pacific. And so with that, um, I've no disclosures. Um, I do wanna say that I don't speak for our Lahui at large, our Native Hawaiian community or the Pacific Islander community at large. I'll speak um, on behalf of myself, um, but I am speaking from the voice of a Native Hawaiian from both my mom and my dad's lineages. Um, so I'll start with talking a little bit about myself, just for some context. So I'm from Oahu. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have been here. Um, these are my parents and my sister. Um, I'm from Mililani up in the uh, mountains of Oahu. Uh, my mom was a public school teacher in the pineapple field towns that we're from. And my dad uh, started out as the mailroom boy in our uh, power plant on our island. Um, but, uh, you know, I went to the Kamehameha Schools, uh, which is a school founded in 1887 by Princess Bernice Poahi Bishop, um, really to kind of um, continue the legacy of Native Hawaiian culture and tradition in the setting of when she founded the schools. Um, there was a significant health uh, a burden that was happening within our population, which I will be talking about today. So I did my training out at Johns Hopkins and for some context during my PhD, you know, I didn't have any family members in science or healthcare or medicine. And I was really just inspired by actually my Ohana, my family. I've had 10 family members with a variety of different cancers from endometrial cancer to, you know, neuroblastoma and pediatrics. And I uh, was really inspired by my family, um, 10 family members with cancer, only one of whom is alive today. And I, growing up, just really thought that cancer was something that Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders would just get and die from. And that was until I went to Hopkins. I joined the lab of um, Dr. Fu Tran, 
who is a MD PhD physician scientist um, who um, allowed me to do some bench work uh, and I looked at sugar metabolism, but he was the first physician who I ever met in my life who um, you know, really took me into the clinic and as a physician, let me see how he interacts with patients. And I saw for the first time him use the words, let's go for cure. And that was definitely something that inspired me and led me to where I am today which um, in route was Mayo Clinic. I was very grateful for the opportunity to go to Mayo. They um, you know, invested in me and paid for me to go back to our island communities. I went to Waimanala Health Center and Queens West Oahu and saw in predominantly native Hawaiian communities how healthcare was delivered. And again, now I'm a Stanford PGY3 resident here in the Department of Radiation Oncology. And with that, um, here's a little bit about my uh, academic background that I'll go through today. I'll talk about some background on Pacific Islanders generally, then focus more on Hawaii. And then I'll talk about Native Hawaiian health, go into, um, again, the topic of NHPI data and structural racism, and then kind of go from there and talk about what we can do when we actually properly disaggregate data. And with that, I do always start off my talks by just commenting on when we think about the world as you know this, this big expanse of uh, land and water, I think that we're oftentimes biased in terms of what the world is. And that's because of when you Google the world and you know these people who are not Pacific Islanders who are oftentimes making these maps, they uh, do this thing where they're focusing so much on the Americas and Africa and Europe. And what they're doing by doing that is really ripping apart the map and really these emphasizing our Pacific. So that's why when I give these talks, I'm really trying my best to reframe the Pacific and really make sure that we're not forgetting this part of the world that is oftentimes spread apart by a map. And so I also show this image just in the context that uh, Asia, most people will recognize this. This is probably more of the east and south side of Asia. But when we think about the Pacific Islands, we oftentimes forget how vastly far away the Pacifics are. Um, is ranging from Tonga in the south to Hawaii up north and the Mariana Islands um, um, more uh, to the west. And so we have to think about these islands and, and who they are when we really think about who are we talking about when we're talking about Native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders. When we think about Pacific Islanders, we're also thinking about how we're all connected together, and that's through our oceanic voyaging heritage. We are a uh, people who are deeply rooted in our ability to, and our ancestors' ability to navigate the world intentionally. And prior to kind of um, more academic, uh, the, the original academic thoughts were uh, these are a group of people who just got shipwrecked on, on these islands and coincidentally landed on these islands. But in fact, we know from you know Master Navigator Mao in Micronesia and Nainoa Thompson from Hawaii. We know that our ancestors sailed these oceans very intentionally and had this master mastery of, of kind of our planet. And, and that is what draws us together as Pacific Islanders. In terms of where we are on the map, you know, generally, there are these three ethnogeographic regions of Micronesia, Melanesia, and Polynesia. And these are the three regions from which Pacific Islanders come from. And so in Micronesia, the small islands, you might have heard of obviously the federal states of Micronesia, but also islands such as Guam or the Marshall Islands or the Commonwealth Northern Mariana Islands. In Melanesia, the darker islands, you have islands like Fiji and Papua, and then Polynesia, the many islands, obviously Samoa and Hawaii, but also islands like Tonga um, and uh, uh, New Zealand, Aotearoa as well. And so each of these islands have their own unique uh, indigenous people that are from the land. They are, again, oceanic voyaging peoples. And uh, in Hawaii, for example, we have Kanakawaiwi. These are the native Hawaiian people that still persist today. When we look at the United States more broadly in terms of the breakdown of native Hawaiians, obviously native Hawaiians are the most common because of the state of Hawaii. But this is um, shortly followed by Samoans, Chamorro from uh, uh, Guam, as well as Tongans. Um, and that's a little bit about Pacific Islanders. So now I'd like to just jump into a little bit more detail about Hawaii, especially because um, as many of us know it as Hawaii is one of the states of the United States. So um, going back in time, 
Um, while this timeline is a little debated and there's actually some excellent Stanford researchers kind of looking into this issue right now, let's say first voyages came around 500 AD. It wasn't until you know, millennia later when Captain Cook was the first Western contact of the Hawaiian Islands um, in 1778. Um, and shortly after that, King Kamehameha I was the first king to unite all the Hawaiian islands under one rule, and that was the Hawaiian kingdom. A lot of people don't recognize today, but Hawaii as a kingdom, we had our own independence and sovereignty that was internationally recognized with treaties with other nations such as Great Britain and France. And La Kuokoa is our Independence Day that was recognized when we were our own Hawaiian kingdom. But as many of us are aware, the illegal overthrow of our Hawaiian kingdom occurred in 1893 when Queen Little Kalani was held at gunpoint in Iolani Palace and was forced to give up her throne. And I include this in my talk to really hear the mana or the, the power, the message behind her words when she writes, I, Queen Little Kalani, by the grace of God and under the constitution of the Hawaiian kingdom, Queen he do hereby solemnly uh, protest uh, against any and all acts um, done, um, done against myself and the constitutional government of the Hawaiian kingdom uh, by certain persons claiming to have established provisional government of and for this kingdom. And so she's really protesting this uh, government that is from the United States who's coming in. And so she continues on and says, now I do, um, of, uh, now to avoid any collision of armed forces and perhaps the loss of life. I do this under protest and impelled by said forces, yield my authority until such time as the government of the United States shall upon facts being presented to it, undo this action of its representatives. And so what she's saying is she does not want the Hawaiian kingdom to be taken away from her, but she does so to avoid bloodshed and any loss of life. And she cares so much about her kingdom that she does this um, unwillingly, but to do so to keep peace. And so shortly after that, we know that the annexation occurred and then Hawaii became a U.S. territory. And in terms of how we see Hawaii today, it is the 60th state. And um, while many of us, especially in my generation, um, will come to think Hawaii is only this state where we go and, uh, you know, have a nice vacation, but really, um, we don't recognize of this history. And so to put into some context, my grandma, she was born in Hawaii as it was a US territory. And her grandma was born in Hawaii as the Hawaiian kingdom. So it was truly not that long ago when our grandparents and their grandparents were living in a world where they were not a part of the United States. And with that context, I now would like to talk a little bit more about um, the uh, native Hawaiian health. And so while we as Hawaiians had Olala Hawaii, our oral tradition and oral language, we did not have a written language. So Captain James Cook, while again, through possibly a uh, racist lens, but through a westernized lens, nonetheless, he did see our people and he documented very well who he thought our people were. And he noted that they were very well made, ran very gracefully with agility, and were able to endure a great amount of fatigue. And this is because our people were able to work lo'ikala, work in the taro patches, you know, they surf, they, you know, were able to, they were very, very good at agriculture, and um, they were great fishermen, and they were very active people. And therefore, they had good strength, and they had good health at that time. And this was due in part to the kahuna la'au lapa'au, who were very essential for the survival of a group of people that were, again, in the most remote areas of the entire world. They, these uh, doctors, the kuhuna la'o lapa'o, they were medicinal healers. They were very connected to spirituality, especially to the aina, to the land, um, of which uh, they drew upon medications um, to, to help uh, heal some of the, the illnesses of the time. But that alone was not sufficient to uh, overcome what was about to come. And within the first you know, 100 years or so, within the introduction of Western colonization, we do see that uh, you know 95% of our native Hawaiian population actually went extinct. And a lot of people don't recognize this. So by the time it was 1900, there was really only 20 to 30,000 native Hawaiians left. 
of which less than half were actually of reproductive age. And so our population nearly went extinct, and, but as a product of colonization. But when we talk about colonization, colonization throughout the Pacific, this is not just a Hawaii-specific phenomenon as islands throughout the Pacific have been colonized. And uh, this was uh, in part due to the fact that military bases could be put on these islands and strategically other countries could take over. And so with that came not only the introduction of you know, diseases that killed us off, but also it led to um, erasure of identity, historical trauma, loss of culture and land. And it really imposed on the native people of all of these islands a set of um, foreign principles that we then were forced to adjust to. And some of these adjustments came at the cost of war. So during the Cold War, for example, there was an equivalent of over 7,200 Hiroshima bombs that were detonated throughout the Marshall Islands alone. And these islands today in some areas are uninhabitable. But this was not just the Marshall Islands. This occurred also throughout French Polynesia as well. And so from these physical harm that is done to our aina, to our land, with that came other health consequences, not only the radioiodine fallout causing a variety of cancer, but also things like um, being afraid or, or averse to radiation. And while we talk about oncology and cancer as a byproduct of this radioiodine fallout from the nuclear bombings, um, there's a variety of different cancer in the literature, but I do um, on Palm I review of the literature, believe the thyroid cancer data and how these nuclear bombings um, have led to spikes in thyroid cancer throughout islands in the Pacific. And in my own research here at Stanford, we, um, Dr. Paula, um, Brianna Lau and um, Vera um, and our group have looked at things such as radiation treatment refusal. So this is in the setting of when patients um, with cancer are you know in the hospital and we're uh, we as physicians are um, recommending radiation when we look at the racial disparities in the United States of who's refusing radiation therapy at the at the um, highest level it truly is the native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander population that is doing so and we've found in our research that these numbers are only increasing even more in the recent decades so that's signals to us that there is probably a component of historical trauma related to, at least in some part, this aversion to radiation. But oncology aside, there's a number of medical comorbidities that um, have been looked at in terms of the Pacific Islands. So for example, obesity as it relates to elevated BMI, when you look at the WHO data and you look at all 195 countries and spread them out, and you look at the countries with the top rates of obesity in the entire world. The top 10 countries are all Pacific Island nations. When you look at this list, people who are unfamiliar with the, these islands might not recognize that every single one of these islands on the top 10 are all um, Pacific Islands, but they are. And that's uh, in relationship to the fact that we in America think that the United States itself is a very obese country. And so, you know, it, it must be not forgotten that this is a, a worldwide problem of a variety of comorbidities that are often forgotten among these Pacific Island nations. And so in Hawaii, uh, as, as an island and state, you know, uh, our native Hawaiian population actually has the highest rates of obesity, but not just obesity, it's every single one of these chronic diseases um, as reported by the Hawaii State Department of Health. And so when you look at all of these in the context of um, the shortest life, uh, it causing the shortest lifespan, when you look at all of the racial and ethnic groups in Hawaii, there's been decades worth of data of native Hawaiians and um, in our own native lands having the lowest life expectancies um, compared to all racial and ethnic groups. And so that is not a Hawaii specific problem. We look at data from across the Pacific. This is taken from this Lancet report from a while back, but what they are um, displaying here is that compared to the non-indigenous populations in islands from Australia to the Marshall Islands, the uh, indigenous populations always have significantly and up to 17 years on average, less life expectancy compared to non-indigenous populations. But this disparity doesn't exist 
at the end of life. It starts from the very beginning of life. So from infant mortality to infant low birth weight, there's a significant disparity among indigenous populations um, compared to the non-indigenous populations in these Pacific islands. And back in the United States, we're recognizing that this is, goes beyond Hawaii. This is becoming a national issue. So even when we think about houselessness in the United States and substance use, um, this is a paper that we published um, in JAMA, um, um, kind of reviewing the data of um, all five racial groups plus Hispanic ethnicity compared to all of these Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders are at the highest rates of, the, um, of these issues. And so this is often swept under the rug in terms of displaying the data. And so a lot of work is being done now to really make sure that Pacific Islander health is not forgotten. And so with that, I'd like to now transition into talking more about data, um, data disaggregation and how it relates to structural racism. So structural racism um, was detailed um, very early on, but was reported very nicely in this Lancet paper. And the authors uh, describe it as ways in which society reinforces these racial discriminatory practices through different beliefs and values and distribution of resources. And so structural racism can be found in the housing sector and the education system, the justice system and healthcare as well. And so when we think about structural racism, it, um, at least in the context of what I do, oftentimes it's about how are we looking and handling data? And so when I think about data as it regards to, as it relates to Native Hawaiian and the Pacific Islanders, I have to remind us about the U.S. Public Law 103-150. Back in 1993, at the 100th anniversary of the legal overthrow of the Hawaiian Kingdom, Senator Akaka and others formed this joint resolution um, across the Senate um, and House of Representatives. And what they do in this report um, is not only recognize the legal overthrow, but they also comment on the suppression of Native Hawaiian sovereignty, apologize for the overthrow, and start reconciliation with Hawaii. But for me as a data scientist, the most important thing was this um, drop of a little hint of the definition of Native Hawaiians, as they define as people who are Aboriginal to the islands prior to Captain Cook in 1778. And why I find that so important in this U.S. public law was because a few short years later, the 1997 Office of Management and Budget released their revision of standards for race and ethnicity. And so when you look at it for the first time in 1997, this was a quarter century ago, Native Hawaiian or other Pacific Islanders is um, for the first time disaggregated out from our Asian American um, uh, colleagues, and uh, we are becoming our own population that is then recognized on a federal level. And I also take this time to note that Title 25 defines Native in the United States as American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian. So this is um, a point that I learned late in my career uh, doing this work of, of why we don't say um, you know, Native Americans, uh, and we say American Indian and Alaska Native. And we really do say that because when we say Native Americans, we're actually also talking about Native Hawaiians. And so when we truly talk about our indigenous cousins on the continent, American Indian and Alaska Native is the correct terminology. But this is also the reason why we say Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders, because when we talk about um, NHPI as a group, we're saying that Native Hawaiians are Pacific Islanders, but we also happen to be a, a people whose ancestry ties us to lands currently occupied by the United States through statehood. And so public law led to things like counting us on the census for the first time in 2000. Mind you, the first census was in 1790. And this led to things like finding out that Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders are growing at rates four times the non-NHPI population in the United States. And this also made a huge impact on healthcare as well. So one way that we count patients, uh, race and ethnicity in healthcare is just by asking them. And this is recorded in things like the electronic medical record, but also in large databases. So um, this is a report from the Hawaii Tumor Registry, um, the cancer at a glance that comes out every few years. And as an early scientist, I um, during, while I was in my PhD, I remember reading this um, publication and flipping through the hundreds of pages, 
And just reading over and over again, Native Hawaiians in our own native land have the highest mortality, highest mortality, highest mortality in every single one of these cancers, again, in our own indigenous lands. And this resonated with me as a Native Hawaiian, as someone who's had 10 family members with cancer, all who are Native Hawaiian, all but one who have died. I totally understood this data and it resonated with me. And then I was surprised when I got into the field of data, big data, data science and population science, especially in the oncology world, where over and over again, I saw aggregated data with Asian Americans, which again are an unrelated racial category according to the 1997 OMB. When we categorize Asian American and Pacific Islanders together, every single one of these papers shown here in you know, relatively prominent journals are all saying that NHPI do have better survival compared to non-Hispanic white. And that to me was shocking because that was not reflective of the data from the University of Hawaii Cancer Center, nor did it resonate with my family or my ohana as well. And so, you know, even more so, there were very large organizations even as late as 2020. So the American Association for Cancer Research, an organization I love dearly. I was a part of the American, um, the AACR Associate Member Council for, for years, um, you know, they too aggregated Asian and Pacific Islander data showing that COVID rates were so low among the Pacific Islander population, which is not true in data I'll show in just a second, but also in combining Asian and Pacific Islanders, the incidence was so low. And they commented specifically uh, that the AAPI population have the lowest overall cancer incidence and death. And again, to me, as a Pacific Islander, that just did not make any sense. And so this, to me, called into question um, um, this concept of structural racism as I, as I read through Brittany Moore's paper, who's from UC, um, UC, uh, Riverside, and uh, Nina Ponce from uh, UCLA, the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. Um, they published this paper on how specifically for Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders, structural racism is a big deal. And this is because data oppression and data omission really is a product of colonialization and how our populations have been colonized over uh, the centuries. And our data that has been erased, erased leads to things like gaps and um, um, a lack of knowledge of what's actually going on within our populations. And that's led to things like a lack of funding, a lack of attention, and a lack of research that otherwise could be improving some of the disparities that are existing but are hidden by the data. And so that's why in this comment in JAMA, I really made a, um, a push to not use the terminology of AAPI or AANHPI. For one, I think when we are making the majority of letters in the alphabet, but 98% of the time we're only talking about Asians, I just don't think that it's a helpful uh, and truly inclusive terminology. Um, I also think that um, it truly masks the concept that Pacific Islanders are an oceanic voyaging um, peoples who uh, span the Pacific and have um, a connected culture, language, health, and tradition. And so I also pause here in saying that I also think it goes the other way around. There are many different types of health and mental health disparities among the Asian uh, American population, which in and of itself is a heterogeneous group uh, in particular. But, um, you know, when the COVID pandemic was first happening, there was a lot of like stop Asian hate and any AANHPI got wrapped into that. But I looked at many of my Pacific Islander colleagues and friends, and none of us face the same things as Asian Americans, particularly East Asians, who did go through a lot of um, system, uh, systemic racism and, and, and blunt racism. And so um, to kind of group us together, I really think does a disservice to both groups and minimizes the experiences from both sides. So transitioning a little bit, I do want to talk about the nuance, obviously, of multiraciality, something that I um, am really looking into in my own research. And this is the fact that I, I crunched the numbers from the 2020 census looking at multiraciality that is being more than one race um, uh, among people who uh, identify as Pacific Islanders, according to the 2020 census. And what we find, or what I what I found was that, uh, and and what is true among my community that I know is that uh, the majority of us are multiracial, and even more so, the majority of Pacific Islanders who are multiracial are not Asian and Pacific Islander; they're actually white and Pacific Islander. And that again 
has to do with the fact of our very long standing history with colonization. We are not an immigrant story. We are a colonization story where people came to our lands and, and invaded our lands. Um, and, and therefore, by a product of multi uh, raciality and, and and kind of intermixing, we became a product of, uh, again, multiraciality. And so uh, to me, in terms of data, when we only look at the NHPI alone, which is, I would say, the majority of research, in, including um, many of my own research, because of, again, structural racist practices, um, we are missing the majority of the Pacific Islander story. And so that's why I think Moving forward, there's um, a lot of people who have been looking at multiraciality, more so in intersection, um, like other sorts of fields, not necessarily healthcare, um, but mostly from pub public health perspective. And we need that perspective in terms of big healthcare data. So just a couple of problems I wanted to talk about in terms of structural racist uh, tendencies that we have. These are things that as a reviewer, I ask, uh, in terms of NHPI inclusion and what authors then respond to me in their rebuttals. Um, first is a small sample problem of, oh, we didn't have enough sample size so we couldn't uh, look at NHPI. But one of the things that multiple research have, have already shown is the combination of small populations um, can actually be very helpful in the context of actually having statistical power to then compare to larger populations. And so uh, Andy Subica, for example, has published a number of studies, including um, not just oncology, but obesity research. Pulling data across time and space has been very helpful in terms of being able to kind of investigate these smaller populations, such as Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders, as well as American and Alaska Native populations. The other problem that we get a lot is, oh, the data just doesn't exist. And that is something that was apparent in this um, Lancet study published um, uh, last summer. It was uh, the 2000 to 2019 life expectancy report by county in the United States. And in their report, they say Asians and Pacific Islanders, they have higher you know, life expectancy compared to all the races, including the white population. And so Karen Pellegrin out at, uh, Dr. Pellegrin out at University of White Hawaii Hilo, was one of the reviewers on the study and she pushed back as someone who uh, does research uh, and community-based research in Hawaii. She realized that this was not congruent at all with what her knowledge was of the um, native Hawaiian population. And so what she did was she recommended and said, hey, you have data on county level data. County level data also has the percentage of Pacific Islanders versus the population of Asian Americans. And so what she suggested was plotting out, as you can see on the x-axis, this is the percent of NHPI versus um, Asian population. And on the y-axis is life expectancy. And what they were able to show with just this simple plot is that populations that were predominantly NHPI actually had the lowest life expectancy. And conversely, populations that had little to no NHPI actually had the highest life expectancy. And these were trends that are actually published in this Lancer report that I was able to be a part of this invited commentary on with Dr. Pellegrin. And so why is all of this data inclusion important? It can actually have very significant um, public health kind of repercussions. And so one of them is evidenced by the COVID pandemic. And so very early on in the COVID pandemic, you know, we saw a lot of Black and Hispanic disparities in the news, like very front and center. Yet within our Pacific Islander communities, very early on, there was nothing about our communities. And so quite quickly, uh, investigators from UCLA, for example, um, they kind of all came together, collected data, um, to, uh, which I'll show in a second. But there are a number of news articles that came out when a number of Pacific Islanders we're realizing that our populations were at very high risk of dying from COVID. And many of these stories have quotes along the lines of, I was naive to think that I couldn't be touched by my family. And in my own ohana, I know that this was true for me too. I was on call here at Stanford as a resident, and I was actually doing double call because my auntie, uh, who was taking care of my native Hawaiian uncle, um, was then calling me to let me know oh, your uncle just got COVID and very quickly did he compensate and ended up dying that week while I was on call. And that to me spoke volumes in terms of 
how little did I even know about the COVID pandemic and how it was really truly impacting my Ohana, my community, my Lakui, and the Pacific Islander community at large. And so I leave us on this section really by showing, uh, really by asking um, and, and stating more so that in order to combat structural racism, we have to do three things in terms of the data. NHPI data have to be included in the study. From the very beginning, from the very initial um, design of the of studies, NHPI data has to be included. If the numbers are zero, the numbers are zero, but at least there's intentionality with the inclusion of Pacific Islander data. The second thing is the data has to be disaggregated. Just because it's collected disaggregated doesn't mean it remains disaggregated. So it must remain disaggregated in the data process. And then finally, the data has to be reported. I've seen a number of times when NHPI data is disaggregated, but then in the actual publication, it's reported as aggregated data, and that doesn't help anyone. And so these three things, I think, are key concepts in order to um, kind of combat structural racism in big healthcare data. And so I'll kind of wrap up my talk just with this last section, really highlighting some key um, uh, kind of studies that have looked at data disaggregation among the Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander um, population. And so again, I bring this to, obviously, we're in the COVID pandemic. And so um, very early on, again, as I mentioned, COVID was not uh, in the news as it regarded to, uh, related to um, the Pacific Islander population. And so um, again, Brittany Mori and Nina Ponce and others uh, at UCLA Health Policy Lab they were the first to um, you know, collect very big data, looking at uh, you know, every, the first of all, they looked at all the states and saw which ones were in accordance to the 1997 Office of Management and Budget um, uh, race categorization and reporting it. And of the 50 states, only 20 of them were actually doing it correctly, right? So that, that alone was a red flag. But you know, they did look at the 20 states that actually provided the data for NHPI. And of those 20 states, 18 of the 20 states showed that Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders had the highest mortality due to COVID compared to all other racial and ethnic groups. And this, again, has been completely missed by the public um, and, and not seen in, in the majority of kind of popular media, uh, especially as it pertains to healthcare, um, because we don't pay attention to Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders enough. And so in my own line of work, uh, this is some work from um, the Hawaii Tumor Registry with Dr. Brenda Hernandez of Lenore Lu. And so what we looked at um, in the setting of oncology, for example, was we looked at women who had non-invasive breast cancer, so DCIS, um, for example, they got their normal treatment. And then the question was, who gets this invasive second breast cancer down the line, even though they got then um, treated for that first non-invasive breast cancer. And this is critical from a healthcare standpoint, because if we have a better understanding of predicting who's gonna get that second breast cancer, we might be able to um, provide you know, some, some kind of a guidance for some of our Pacific Islander or other patients who might be at more risk. And so that's exactly what we found though, that with this data from the Hawaii Tumor Registry that compared to all racial and ethnic groups in Hawaii, Native Hawaiian women had the highest rates of both ipsilateral and contralateral breast cancers um, after being treated for, again, that initial non-invasive breast cancer. Um, another breast cancer study um, that I uh, did with uh, Fumiko Chino out at Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, we aim to disaggregate out this single line that's often rec represented as for the Asian and NHPI um, population. I am a big fan of smart data disaggregation. I have seen papers that disaggregate all 30 plus ethnic groups. I think that sometimes you miss force for the trees and you don't um, get the message of what's actually happening sometimes when you do that. And so what I like to do, at least in my work, and some people may disagree, is looking at East, Southeast, and um, South Asian populations. But in this unadjusted Kappa-Meyer curve, the basic story is that Pacific Islanders were the only group that um, kind of pulled out away in the survival curve, kind of, again, highlighting the key disparity that NHPI are different from Asian. Um, but, you know, in that smart disaggregation, what we can also find is, um, which is consistent in a lot of my work, that Southeast Asians tend to be more similar in terms of healthcare outcomes um, to Pacific Islanders 
compared to East and South Asians. And so this was a study that we looked at the time interval, for example, between um, breast conserving surgery um, and then radiation, because we know that that, radi that interval is very important and prolonged intervals between the time surgery and radiation can lead to poor outcomes. And so we find that Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders have significant longer delays. Um, as we've talked about, comorbidity burden is, um, uh, so the number of comorbidities that a patient has is significant to the Pacific Islander population. This is a study published in JAMA that we did looking at um, comparing uh, non-Hispanic white to each of these groups. Only Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders had higher rates of comorbidity burden. And that's significant if you think about the inclusion criteria of who can be involved even with oncology clinical trials. Uh, having written you know, a clinical trial, I oftentimes know that um, patients who have higher comorbidity burden or, or kind of like worse performance status oftentimes get excluded from these clinical trials. And so that's why data like this, and this was the largest NHPI oncology study um, that I've been able to find. Um, it really shows that kind of we have to focus on things like comorbidity burden so that we can be in better inclusive for this patient population, especially as it pertains to oncology clinical trials. Um, in the same study, we, we find that even adjusting for the um, comorbidity burden, Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders actually have worse survival across the most common cancers, and that's uh, and shown in red, and that's in comparison to um, the improved survival of many of the South, Southeast, and East Asian populations, um, which is, again, consistent with you know, when you aggregate these two groups together, that's kind of what the story has always been. And so uh, my colleagues out at the NCI, NIH, um, Jamie Shing and um, Jacqueline Vo have also collaborated with me as well, looking at HPV associated cancers, for example. Uh, there's a rise uh, over the you know, decades of oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma that's associated with HPV, especially in the, um, the Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander men. And so that is an example of when we disaggregate data, we can really find um, gaps of maybe healthcare access or you know, patients that we really need to be screening or um, kind of encouraging uh, HPV vaccinations. And so that's really the strength of data disaggregation. And uh, kind of separate but adjacent in terms of not healthcare outcomes, but healthcare workforce, uh, physician workforce. This is a publication that I've done with um, Dr. Kurt DeVille out at Hopkins, really looking uh, as a byproduct of there was a study out in JAMA that came out that looked at um, Asians and Pacific Islanders are uh, three times more likely than the census data to be um, actually represented in the physician workforce. And our data actually shows instead of three times uh, more represented, we're actually half of what we should be comparatively to the census data. And more so, these numbers are declining over the recent decades. And so um, kind of towards the end of my talk, but I did want to highlight, I am very, very lucky and fortunate to have a number of Pacific Islander and Pacific Islander adjacent medical graduate and undergraduate students who have joined my lab. We really focus on things like uh, data disaggregation, but one, I want to really highlight the work of these up and coming physicians and scientists who are Pacific Islander, really because um, they did were able to do things like this one study that um, uh, is not published, but i um, happy to share it here, where we look at um, over 1,100 clinical trial papers from JCL Lancet JAMA and New England Journal. And these students reviewed all of these with me. And uh, we actually find that the populations that are actually the least reported and included in phase two, three oncology clinical trials are our indigenous cousins, the American and the Alaska native population, but also native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islanders. And so why is this really important that we're building this physician workforce for our Pacific Islander? It really is because we know that not just for Pacific Islanders, but also for you know, other races as well, that racially concordant care just uh, portends better outcomes because when you have that shared connection, that leads to you know, uh, understanding of culture, better communication, more trust that leads to medication adherence and so on. And this is data from Kamaka, Paula Fox, Kaholukula and others out in Hawaii. And so why is this important? We're in California, right? Why is this important? The, the point is, is that this is not only a Hawaii issue anymore. Um, as the 2020 census was the first time that there are more Native Hawaiians on the continental U.S. than in Hawaii, 
um, it's becoming more of an issue on the continent. And that is because um, in Hawaii, wages are very low, but cost of living is so high. This is an Associated Press article that just recently came out earlier this year, really describing the diaspora and how people are um, fleeing our own indigenous lands to live more affordably on the continent. And so NHPI issues are becoming continental issues. And with that, a few more slides. I just wanted to really um, comment on the inclusion of Pacific Islander voices are so is so important. Um, and that is why I am so grateful to have all of these Pacific Islander students who are working with me, because um, I really get to tell their stories through their own voices, because academic tourism really does no uh, service for us when other people are talking about us rather than letting us tell our own stories. Um, even here at this institution, I've been asked sometimes to comment on things without authorship, and I've been burned a couple of times, but I am learning. Um, and I do encourage everyone to really include, even in terms of authorship, these young students who want to provide their voices because our context and it, it can help in terms of contextualizing data um, to, to tell a more uh, culturally competent story. Um, and the second point was really interdisciplinary collaborations. I've found it very key, whether it's you know um, genetics or um, you know bench science or population science. I think that there's a lot that we can do, even in terms of machine learning, in terms of really looking at um, this disaggregated data. And then finally, um, allyship is incredibly key. I've relied on a number of my mentors who have been um, non NHPI researchers, but um, just for my dog, uh, not NHPI researchers who've been um, uh, helping me along the way. And with that, I do want to just mention we are making progress. This is a 2022 um, AACR cancer disparities report. Um, again, the same report that did not include a, uh, NHPI aggregate, disaggregated out from Asian Americans. And right here, front and center, Auntie Hawaiian right here saying she's so proud to be Hawaiian and she wants other Hawaiians to know about cancer. And so I really appreciate organizations like ACR. And even journals like the ACS journals really putting asterisks now, citing our work, really saying that when we have API data, we really have to think about it in the context that it might not be the most reflective of our NHPI population. And with that, I just wanna conclude with this slide, just really saying, NHPI, we are culturally and historically distinct from Asian Americans. Um, we are, um, when we aggregate um, or omit NHPI data that only perpetuates structural racism, and then finally, NHPI data should be included, disaggregated, and reported in um, big health care data. And with that, I'd really like to mahalo all of my mentors, all of my collaborators, and the people who, um, the, especially the young Pacific Islanders and Pacific Islander Asian students who have reached out to me over the year, uh, really interested in, in, in kind of this uh, space and really want to make improvements within our communities. Um, and with that, mahalo for being here and listening to me, especially on this um, very uh, late time, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Tapara. That was such an amazing talk. I feel really inspired by all of the work that you're doing. It's wonderful. We do have several questions and I encourage everyone to leave questions in the chat or in the QA section. Um, but yeah, let's start off with a couple here. There's someone that mentioned, um, thank you so much for your informative poignant talk. What are the some what are some of the biggest pushbacks that you hear against data disaggregation? And how do you address that pushback and or criticism against? Yeah, in terms of pushback, uh, I, yeah, mahalo for that question. I think that pushback is definitely something that I see um, as a researcher submitting uh, my own research, but more so as um, when I'm a reviewer, but, you know, and then within collaborators sometimes as well. I think it's it's a true issue um, depending on which side you're on. I think that um, when it comes to, uh, you know, access to data, I think sometimes um, uh, some people who don't, some people who have the access to the data are the ones who are sometimes being the gatekeeper of the data and um, might not want to share that data, that data disaggregated. Um, other pushbacks I've uh, experienced or again, when the numbers are too small. So that was a part of the problem that I was saying before. You can kind of circumvent that problem by 
um, kind of grouping the same small population ac across time and space. So space being like geographically, like collecting data from, for example, different SEER databases um, or, or um, different you know public registries. You can kind of collapse those data as well. But um, otherwise, uh, people don't want to, I think, disaggregate AA and NHPI, mostly because they just don't know who NHPI uh, individuals are. And I think that that's why um, it's a it's a privilege for me to be here today to really kind of educate uh, on some of the basics of who I think that we are. Great, thank you so much. Um, I was curious myself kind of related to that um, is, is how when in that slide when you were talking about how there are you know multiracial NHPI individuals um, from your research experiences I don't know if there even is enough data collected on this but are there different health outcome or health disparities that exist within the larger NHPI group like the white NHPI individuals versus Asian or Black and that kind of goes along with my question like how far down do you break or break down the subgroups? Yeah, um, that's also an excellent question, uh, a question that um, I recently received the Stanford Cancer Institute grant for um, with my mentors, Dr. Manali Patel and Archie Palam. We are actually investigating this with some machine learning techniques, um, really to find out like how different are these multiracial groups within NHPI. If you were to ask me, I think uh, you know personally that NHPI multiracial groups in general should be kind of aggregated together regardless. Um, it will circumvent a number of problems, including the this is a too small of a population problem because when we're losing again a huge ch like the majority of Pacific Islander data to the multiracial group, and then we're saying like oh the reason why we can't include it is because it's such a small group like that can you know prevent that. But I think the power of machine learning where that's going to come into play is really be able to piece apart some of the nuances of, you know, are there differences um, with certain combinations of, um, you know, Pacific Islander with some of these other ones? And are they all kind of reflective of the NHPI um, alone group? And I, and I do think that on some level, the social determinants of health kind of all impact NHPI together, regardless of the multiraciality component, but um, we'll have to see what the data shows. Great, thank you. Um, does anyone want to ask their questions? I see like four questions on the chat, but. Um... Hi, uh, Dr. Tapara, this is Latha Palnipan. Um, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, I, I have a question. I've been studying um, cardiovascular disease in um, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Asian American populations. And, and thank you for bringing up um, the, the multiracial uh, issue. And uh, we have noticed that uh, multiracial Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, Asian American populations actually have higher cardiovascular disease risk. Than, um, uh, and I'm wondering if you're noticing that uh, in your cancer work, and if you have any thoughts um, about uh, where um, that signal might be coming from. Yeah, thank you so much for that very excellent question, and one that I think is so relevant to the direction where we need to take this research. I know that my um, colleague and dear friend, Mapuana Antonio, who's the director of um, kind of the MTH uh, program at the University of Hawaii on the Native Hawaiian Health side, um, she and others have looked at this in the concept of even things like obesity and depression, and also have, uh, she's told me she's found similar signals of the multiracial group of the NHPI actually having worse outcomes and, uh, and higher rates of these, uh, comor uh, these uh, chronic diseases. And the way that she's educated me on this, because I was quite surprised to find this, um, their hypothesis was that NHPI alone tend to come from um, more uh, kind of rooted communities where they're surrounded a little bit more by their um, NHPI alone kind of communities versus the multiracial groups and to be more in kind of this mixture of kind of colonization and how colonization has imposed Western values onto Pacific Islanders. And so there's some at least sociology thought 
that perhaps it's this colonization process that's led to the multiraciality, that's led to the loss of identity. And there, I was just on a panel at Harvard last weekend where they really focused on um, uh, the community uh, community researchers really focused on when we are connect when we as Pacific Islanders are connected to our communities and connected to our Lahu or Native Hawaiian communities we really have um, a better sense of self. And that better sense of self really helps guides us and connects us to our culture and then can lead things like a, a better perceived per, um, like perception of health. And so I think that from that perspective, that's kind of where my thoughts are. You know, hearing your very interesting data, um, I, I would say that, that that's something that sounds um, kind of consistent with some of the other things that I've heard and kind of, again, the obesity and the depression space as well. Thank you so much for asking. Um, kind of related to that, there's been some uh, several questions related to kind of um, about lifestyle and diet. So there's, I'm gonna combine two questions. One is just about the native diet versus perhaps the westernized colonized diet that exists um, and how that relates to all these comorbidities that you see. And then kind of conversely, you know, there's um, a, a participant here who says, um, as an Indian born and raised in Fiji, um, their lifestyle and diet has changed so much that they don't feel like they can be counted as Southeast Asian as part of, in, in the data sphere because their lifestyle um, diet has changed so much by growing up in Fiji. So do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, definitely. Um... Hey, I'm mahalo for that question and the combinations of questions. Um, I think diet is definitely something that I get asked about every single time I give this talk. It's obviously something uh, that's that's a very interesting topic, um, especially as someone who studied sugar metabolism in my PhD, um, kind of applying it to the clinical world. I do uh, find it very fascinating, but obviously very hard to control in like a way like uh, dietary science is difficult to control oftentimes in a controlled setting. But, you know, I, I have a few thoughts on it. One, uh, you know, I've had, um, you know, a, a medical students in my group um, uh, led by Eric Panetta, who is um, a medical student at Tulane. And uh, in our review focusing on, uh, that was just published in Cancers, focusing on the Micronesian um, healthcare uh, kind of oncology disparities, um, one of the sections is actually on diet and um, what the Micronesian students um, on the, in the paper actually, so this was a paper that was also including um, uh, Ryan Benavente and Megan um, Jimin. And these were students who are all, you know, either from Yap or, or um, Guam. So they're all Micronesian and they're able to bring their cultural identity into this paper. And some of the things that they talk about were, um, uh, again, how diet now, even, in, even if you were living in Fiji now, even after, I, as I understand it, the kind of enslavement and movement from Indians into Fiji, even the diet at that point in time, that was still not the traditional diet. Um, that and that's more a product colonization of the of, you know that diet. And the reason why we have some of those things is um, when you're looking at islands in the middle of the Pacific, the most remote areas in the entire world, especially in the context of you know prior to having like you know airplanes and things like that. The food that had to be transported, if they were transported in a colonized setting, you know, to feed the people on the islands who are not indigenous, it had to be things with lots of preservatives, lots of salt, you know, things that could be preserved basically to, to last that whole um, kind of migration down to the islands. And so a lot of those extra things that get added to those is completely 180 of the 100% sustainability food that our uh, you know, ancestors lived off of. They, they lived off of the land, the, the loikalo, the, um, you know, the taro patches, and um, you know, they were fishermen, and they were very skilled at cultivating you know, agriculture and, and, and the animals as well. And so they worked for their food versus um, in the colonized world, the types of foods that we have are very different and nutrient um, empty. And so I think that um, that context of how colonization has really impacted, um, you know, the types of foods that you see on the islands nowadays, um, I think has significantly impacted the um, kind of health disparities that we see today. That's great. Um, thank you so much for 
that answer. Um, and we're pretty much at eight o'clock here. So thank you so much, Dr. Tapara, for taking your time out of your busy uh, schedule to give this vital, important talk. And thank you to all of our attendees for joining us. Um, have a great evening, everyone.